Happy Friday, everyone. Operations as code. Do we need another as code? The DevOps loop. Is it really infinite? And is AI the future of e-commerce? We've got all that and more for you on TechStrong Gang. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. It's Alan Schimmel for TechStrong Gang. Welcome to our end of the week show and what a show we have. Um, we've got some great topics. I teased it earlier, but not only do we have great topics, we have a full house of great Tech Strong Gang members. It might be one of our best lineups ever. Let me introduce you to our gang folks for today. First of all, then they're all returning gang folks if you watch Tech Strong Gang. And if you don't watch Tech Strong Gang, you can watch it on TechStrong.tv. We have every episode up there, as well as on the Tech Strong TV YouTube channel. So please check that out. You could subscribe on YouTube as well and never miss an episode. Uh, but let me get back to introducing my friend Lisa Martin. She is the host of her old podcast. And Lisa, what's the name of your podcast? Hey, Alan, it's called Marketing, Art, and Science. We really dissect with CMOs how they're pulling those levers and flexing those muscles of art and science and things like generative AI to really improve business outcomes. Absolutely. I queued that up for you real well, Hallie's. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Alan. Wait well, to you. Kevin, thanks for being <laughs> here. Uh, Lisa, I should also mention, is with the Futurum Group, where uh, does an, an analysis of marketing uh, industry spotlights as well. Also joining us, well, as part of Futurum Group and Visual Impact, he's their CTO. He's also a longtime friend of us of us here at uh, TechStrong, Guy Courier. Guy, welcome. How are you? Doing great. It's good to be here. It's good to have you back on, Guy. Always good to have your input on our gang shows. Speaking of input on our gang shows, she's kind of our newest gang member, and we are thrilled, tickled pink to have her here. Hope Lynch, DevOps, software development, operational IT person. Yes. Extraordinaire. Hey, Hope, <laughs> welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me back once again, Alan. Uh, this is a highlight. I love the topics that we discuss and uh, little rabbit holes I get to go down when I'm. Yeah, I know. I'm, Look, it keeps it interesting, man. Yeah. Thinking of keeping it interesting. <laughs> Uh, he's the C our CTO here at uh, Textron, but he's also Futurum CTA, and he's been doing a bunch of writing and talking lately, and and an original gang member, a founding gang member, Mitch Ashley. Hey, Mitchell. Wow, I forgot to wear my colors. Or maybe I was just thinking that maybe we should have put you on like some kind of what do you call headband that or yeah, something. Yeah, I need a like facial tattoo or something, don't I? <laughs> I'm going to on that. Okay, yeah, we're not that hold kind on of gag. <laughs> I won't propose any. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good to be here, and I uh, love being here with uh, Lisa Hope and Guy. Absolutely. So it's a great panel, and then joining me here in our Boca Raton headquarters studios, unfortunately still lamenting yet another Yankees lost at the hands of the Texas Rangers. We weren't. This wasn't even a blown one. We were behind from the get go. Um, Mike Vizard. Sad thing again. It's another sad day for you in Yankee land. Right. But I have a new title, apparently, according to Hope, since I'm put together some of these subjects. So that makes me master of the rabbit holes. Is that master of the rabbit holes. <laughs> Maybe we should change your name to Peter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, wow. <laughs> so it is Friday today, and uh, we're, we're allowed to take a little liberty like that. Yeah. But let, we, let's get serious. We've got some good stuff to talk about. I think the first one is, um, we call it the rise of operations as code. This comes off of a, a, a great article over on DevOps.com. And, and Mike, I'm, I, I want to throw it over to you to kick off. I, you and I spoke about this. I was skeptical, but I think they won me over. You were skeptical. I'm surprised. There you go. Shocking. Shocking. Um, well, as far as I can tell, theoretically, we've been talking about IT as code now for years, and we kind of take it for granted in a lot of spaces, and then we talk about tests for code, but why not take it to its logical conclusion? Every operations we can think about can be codified, and it can be managed as code, and 
maybe in some regards, I wonder if we've been limiting our thinking. And when I read this article, I was like, wow, you know, it kind of opens up uh, a way of thinking that goes beyond DevOps or it takes DevOps thinking to people outside of DevOps and those processes. So Hope, I know you've been kind of floating around this whole DevOps category as long as we have, but yeah. what's your take on, you know, can we export DevOps as a philosophy to all kinds of operations? I do believe that we can. I think um, if you are truly speaking of the philosophy, uh, collaboration, rapid cycles of learning, all of those things, they are a benefit for anyone. But um, if we're talking about how we are codifying everything, I think that does bring opportunities for organizations to work even more tightly together and have a better understanding of what they're trying to achieve and, and work toward outcomes. Guy, let me ask you here as well, because, you know, we hear the term hyper automation a lot and everybody kind of nods their heads a little bit. And I'm not sure everybody knows what they are actually nodding their head to when they hear that term, but, um, you know, can we take code and kind of start automating processes in ways that we never imagined before? And maybe we can do things in the age of AI that we would have considered impossible. And we're just short of imagination at the moment. I don't know if we're short of imagination. Uh, this automate everything everywhere all the time <laughs> idea uh, is pretty old. Um, you know, uh, my first thought is keep an eye on your test plants because now you're extending, um, you know, rapid development and CI CD and all these wonderful, speedy, responsive things that you're doing with code. Um, farther out from their landing spot, whether it's in the infrastructure, infrastructure is code now expanding up uh, farther towards workflows and uh, security, sec ops, all that other sort of stuff. Um, but that means every single thing you do can have a potentially greater impact. The optimist in me, I'm very optimistic about um, automation, especially uh, when it comes to uh, the, the increasing use of AI, generative AI in particular. Um, I think actually uh, cynicism and pes pessimism, which is more my natural state, um, has told me for a while, nobody really understands this stuff yet. People are stepping forward without knowing what they're stepping into and all that other sort of thing. But I'm starting to feel that there's a lot of recognition of the dangers and there's a lot of hard work being done um, to, uh, to automate and to insert AI more responsibly and ensure the human element, human review and that sort of thing. So this to me, it's like taking DevOps, like you say, in the DevOps paradigm, um, to this new level, that's going to actually be extremely helpful. Uh, and, um, I'll just come back to everybody. Remember, you still need to test. You still need to do QA. You still need to be able to regress. You need to be able to do all of these things. None of this, um, makes any of that obsolete in the slightest. No. So I, I, as I mentioned, I had a few thoughts on this one, Imusabi. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> that's from yesterday. Just, going back from yesterday. But anyway, um, first of all, a lesson I've learned through 10 years of DevOps.com is just because you can automate doesn't mean you should, right? And I think that's a valuable lesson that we have, many of us in DevOps have learned the hard way and they have the t-shirts and scars to prove it. Just because you can automate something doesn't mean you should, because oftentimes, Guy, to your point, you automate, you go faster here, but it creates a warp or a bottleneck somewhere else because they can't handle that level or, or that, you know, velocity. So speed can kill sometimes. Secondly, though, for those of you out there who are saying, oh, yes, just yet another as code. We have infrastructure as code. We have IT as code. We have this as code and that as code. What do we, what does this as code really mean? Well, automation is part of it. Yes. Once you, once you boil something down to uh, making it a code, it allows us to replicate that at a much faster speed and automate it. 
And so when we had infrastructure as code, for instance, when we first started DevOps.com, right? Puppet and Chef were, were the dominant uh, DevOps tools because it allowed you to, to do, you know, spin up servers in AWS in essence, right? As code, it became a recipe, a cookbook and chef, if you will. Um, so when we talk about operations as code, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about taking that next piece of things, not necessarily platform engineering. And I do, I, I highly recommend you read this article because the author does a good job of saying, hey, yes, platform engineering is part of operations and it's setting up these guardrails that allow developers to go faster. But that's not really what we're talking about here in operations as code. We're talking about some of the more traditional operations after code is coded, if you will. Maybe even after testing is testing is done, but though testing is never done. But you know, it, it's it's a lot of that operations that I think falls a lot on SREs and stuff today, right? That's the new ops things. And so the idea of reducing some of those tasks to code, which allows us to, you know, it's kind of have that gold standard to to have that baseline that we can then rinse and repeat over and over and over and faster and faster and faster. It's not BS, it's real. And I think it's, I just never thought of it as operations as code till I read this article. And that's why I said I was skeptical, but I think the article does a, a great job of laying out the logic behind it, how it fits into this whole arc. And, and I think it's one of the best articles we've had on devops.com in a long time, if I say so myself. All right. Mitch, how do we kind of put our arms around this speed issue? And, and I'll give you a quote from somebody who I was talking to about AI about this, and they just kind of looked at me and they said, you know, well, it's one thing to be wrong. It's another thing to be wrong at scale. So how do we kind of wrap some guardrails and controls around this thing so speed doesn't kill? Yeah. I think one one principle should, we should apply is the thinking that got you here is not the thinking that's going to take you that, to the next place, right? So I, I think what would, would basically kind of give us lead boots, cement boots is to, to use a, <laughs> a metaphor from one of our favorite Sopranos shows, um, it is it's not about writing code. We don't want operations people to go write a bunch of Python code or something, right? Um, this article talks about Terraform. By Terraform, you don't write code. You provide a configuration information that's written in something that looks like code, but it's just a configuration file and then has an automation process to do that. And so, you know, doing things faster to your point, if you really applied more than just automation, the principle behind uh, DevOps and Lean and, and others is think about it this way. Let's let's look at where the bottlenecks are. Where, where do we have things that slow down that can't that get done quickly enough? Or where we're, do we have highly repetitive tasks that, that we're spending valuable resources on? Maybe we could automate. And using some of those principles to identify where where we can use um, automation and, you know, and operations as code. So, so kind of being smart about it. The other way, the way, other way to think about it is it doesn't have to be code at all. A lot of the operations tools now, with the inclusion of uh, early days of AI, will identify, hey, this is a workflow you've done in our tool before. Is that a possible automation? Is that a possible runbook we can create for you? We see this pattern. And, and it seems to be consistently on Thursdays that, you know, when the backups run, you go set these flags in this other configuration file, and then that informs some other process. Why don't I automate that for you? So it doesn't even have to be automation. It can be, you know, no code version of automation as code, if you want to think of it that way. So we have to think about this, not just let's go write a bunch of scripts um, to make our lives harder, <laughs> but, but better, maybe. So we're going to have to... Jump to our next one. But before we do, you let the guy from Colorado do Sopranos things. Who ever heard of lead overshoes? He meant cement overshoes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm Adam. I haven't watched an episode in a long time. 
<laughs> but it's like what is like the 40 year anniversary of it or something yeah, no but golly i know you picked up on that right away from from your <laughs> roots right we, well you could start calling me johnny lips instead of guy i think yeah, that's you an idea where i'm coming from <laughs> yeah. i mean the, the Platte river is only six feet deep so it doesn't do much good <laughs> yeah. to let, let over i do oh. i do want to mention i know we're we're, we're you know, finishing up, I do want to mention one thing, which is we have to keep in mind what the purpose of automating is. I think the instinct is to say automation lets me be more productive, lets the team be more productive. We can do less. In our imaginings, we just kind of sit back and like George Jetson, we tap the button all day long instead of, you know, having to work quite so hard. But a really important element of automation is just consistency so that those backups are done the same way every single time. Um, that does not absolve us from the responsibility of supervision and attention. But, you know, that's to me, Alan, sort of one of the limiting factors in terms of whether you should or not is understanding that benefit. Absolutely. All right. Let's take a break at this point. We're watching here at Tech Strong Gang, and we're going to come back and talk about that. You know, we've all gotten used to that DevOps infinity loop, right, that we've seen a million times on slides. Mitchell says, don't get caught in the loop. You're watching TechStrong Gang. Discover TechStrong Group, the epicenter of tech innovation. We're your go-to for reaching IT leaders and practitioners worldwide. Our secret? Impactful content that sparks awareness, engagement, and top quality leads. With us, you'll access editorial websites, streaming videos, virtual events, custom content, analyst research, and more. Join our satisfied clients. Let's revolutionize your tech journey. Contact us today and tell your story to the world in the most powerful way with TechStrong Group. Hey, everybody. You know, sometimes there are things that are around that we just take for granted and everybody sees it every day and they just nod their head and they don't think too much about it. And well, this DevOps loop thing has become one of those things. We all see it. We all know what it's supposed to mean and we all nod our heads. And yet Mitch has this article up on uh, or a presentation he did at tech field day event that has been turned into an article that you can catch on devops.com that will then take you to a link of the video of mitch having this discussion but mitch um you're kind of saying this loop thing maybe is uh shall we say not so infinite and maybe messier than people think it's not actually a loop so so uh, let me tell you why i this is one of those things that, like, this has always really bugged me. Like, you know, the Mike Vazar, this has been bugging me, right? And I'm looking, I've looked at that infinity loop for a long time and thought, you know, it, 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 that isn't how software is created. That loop is just a linear task, a linear, linear series of phases. And if I, if I took a tape measure or a yardstick and folded it into a circle or folded it in a circle and then flipped it to get an infinity loop, it's still a yardstick, right? It's still that process that makes it look like it happens in that order. And, and it really doesn't. When Because you are doing smaller, one of the principles of uh, DevOps is doing smaller pieces of work. We can do that, especially if we're doing cloud native. We're doing smaller pieces of work, um, being able to do that in a distributed fashion, whether it's amongst people or geographically, whatever, is inside each one of those steps, whether it's design, build, uh, test, et cetera, all the way down to deploy and operate, is <clears throat> there's a lot of little tiny loops that are happening in each one of those steps all the time. So 15 developers are sitting here writing code and checking it in and running an, an automated uh, continuous integration when they check that in. And that's happened maybe 100 times, maybe thousands of times a day. Um, and each one of those is their own little loop of doing some development, doing some testing, checking it in, blah, blah, blah. At some point, that moves into the next phase. That that Those pieces get tested again in some automation. Those get combined. Maybe they get released together into production, et cetera. So when you really look at how software is developed in today's modern approaches, is it's not a linear process. It's a lot of executions of steps within that process kind of flowing down to an endpoint where it makes itself into uh, production into some environment that it's then operated in and it's continually updated right you may have updated that's being pushed out and ai models and new fixes to code or vulnerabilities so that, that's why i've given this talk a couple times is in, the infinity loop, loop is nice it, it kind of differentiates devops but if you really think about how it works, don't teach your t team just to do a linear, um, a linear process faster. 
It's about doing smaller steps of work, uh, being able to do those um, independently and then combining where you can collaborate and combining them where you integrate and test and do all those steps. So, Hey, Hope, I, I've been waiting all day for this, but um, is Mitch a little loopy on this or what? <laughs> it, you know, it, it brings to mind uh, a training I did once uh, at an organization for an agile transformation. And there were a variety of people in the room. And on the screen, I showed the infinity loop. I showed the typical waterfall cycle. I was talking through it, you know, by the book. And a person in the audience in the class raised their hand. They said, but isn't that actually the same thing? <laughs> I said, you know, it actually is. It's just in shorter increments. That's, that's, that's really, that's really it. You, you are effectively repeating sort of the same cycles, but the, the key is in, in shorter increments. But one of the other things that came to mind, um, with the DevOps loop is I have seen teams like, like those teams I was training, uh, who are going in and they are implementing DevOps practices but people are saying, what else has changed in the organization? What benefit are we getting from this? They say they're doing something different, but nothing, nothing actually looks different on the outside. And I think some of that is the disconnect from DevOps culture and the over-rotation to saying that DevOps is just about tools and automation. So, you know, look... Listening to this conversation, I'm reminded of a something I read once that if you took a, a strand of DNA, like a chromosome, right, and you, you know, they're all curled up, right? And if you laid out a chromosome in a straight line, to your point, Mitchell, about making that straight lining into a loop, it would be long enough to go around the earth. One little DNA, one little chromosome in your, in one of the trillions of cells in your body. We took that DNA and laid it out. You know, a chromosome laid it out. It would be like enough to go around the earth. So you could pack a lot into a loop, right? But I think that is the beauty of DevOps, and it's not just DevOps. Because keep in mind, DevOps takes off where agile leaves off. And when we talk about doing things in bite-sized chunks, right, it's agile, 25 years old. That is kind of brought that to development, right? The sprints and all of that. Um, and so, you know, it's the old story of how do you eat an elephant? One spoon at a time, one spoonful at a time. And and I think that's the beauty of agile and DevOps and looking it at it in a loop that, yes, maybe it does have all the things that we have in that waterfall, but the concept of doing them in bite-sized chunks and one, one, one spoon at a time is, is the, is kind of the special sauce in, in my mind anyway. Lisa, I'd love to get an outside opinion here because you've been on the show a few times and you've heard us talk about DevOps and, um, I guess, you know, we try to explain this and it's not pervasively adopted yet and everywhere. It's deeply in every enterprise somewhere, but it's not like the dominant way everything is done. From your perspective, does DevOps have something like, a, is there a marketing problem for DevOps? Are we, are we just not having the right terminologies and the things to explain this to people that get more oomph going? Communication is absolutely critical here. I think it's a marketing opportunity. Marketing can be the lingua franca between uh, the development teams, the operations teams. I think marketing can be a facilitator of DevOps evangelism. Where is it working? What are those bite science chunks in which we're seeing successes? And talking about the and reinforcing the organization's commitment to DevOps practices that are successful. That can be content creation, blogs, videos, training materials, et cetera. I think another thing that marketing, where marketing can really turn this into an opportunity is engaging with uh, internal influencers where they are having successes. And what does it mean to the business? 
What does it also mean to the end user customer? So that storytelling piece, I think, is where marketing can come in as that lingua franca and help the teams really clarify what are we doing here? Why are we doing it? To the points being made earlier, what are the benefits that we're seeing as a company? How does it benefit uh, our stakeholders, um, our customers, as I mentioned, investors, the board? What's the value to the business here? And to your point, Mike, I think it has to be crystal clear. And I think in some cases, um, maybe uh, what I'm proposing is cart before the horse, but I do think there's an opportunity from a marketing perspective to really start uh, turning the knob on this into terms of being more widely adopted with more success stories validating it. Okay. I hope you've been, uh, you know, on the sales side of this DevOps motion. What is the challenges with the whole marketing motion as uh, from your perspective and, and given your history? Um, there seems to be plenty of instances of use cases and plenty of examples, but I think the storylines are always kind of like, you know, we, uh, released more code faster and everybody kind of looks up and goes, so what? Yeah. I, I think, I think that that storyline is often driven by people in the organization who believe that there is a productivity angle to it that relates to speed and velocity. Right. But what they should be looking at is, are we building the right things that the customers want, they see value in, and they are actually using? Even if that means we, we kill uh, you know, some of our pets along the way because the customer sees no value in them. So why should we build it? I think so many organizations, as long as we've been talking about DevOps, as long as we've been talking about the foundational pieces of DevOps that are rooted in Agile, the point is still missed that you are doing all of this for someone, whether an internal customer or an external customer, and they are the arbiter of value. So uh, shipping more trash faster is is not an achievement shipping more of the things that they see value in is actually the achievement you know one of the things i think to that point hope is what, what's a little bit deceiving is you know it's why it's why devops is often pegged as a tool or technology when it's really not it's about how you create software and mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done three DevOps implementations in organizations, and the consistent theme is the first thing you have to kind of address and work on, because this is about learning. It's about t learning together how we're going to do things a little bit differently, and you have to to get past some hurdles. And one of them is um, fear of failure, and frankly, um, when there's been situations when there's a penalty for failure and also a um, striving for perfection or too much perfection. Cause there's a, you know, a thought of mind of, I'm not going to release this until it's fully ready. Right. I don't want anything going out with any bugs or anything. And it's going to take us this long. And that's why we take nine months to release a piece of code. And when you tell people that, no, what we're going to do is we're going to take that, we're going to incrementally release this with pieces of functionality and over time we'll have all that functionality in it but it'll be through a whole, a whole bunch of successive smaller releases and that way we can do those in much shorter cycles that's that's an incongruent thought and when you're used to the when you're used to the no it's got to be right when it goes out the door and it better be damn right you know or else my yeah. job's on the line so there's some real hurdles of learning you have to get over um, and not everyone can do that. Not every not every organization is ready to do that. And so you have to take where the organization is and say, how do we not how do we apply DevOps principles? Maybe that's still, you know, we're not ready to get to tackle that problem quite yet. So let's work on this. Take the bottleneck idea. Let's look for where are the biggest bottlenecks and how can we improve flow of work and things like that. So But your point of releasing incrementally in bite-sized pieces, right? The goal there is that customer, whoever they are, if you have built 50% of what you've planned and they say, you know what, I am happy, that's where you stop. 
You don't say, oh, but what about the other 50%? We want to build it. It has no value. Now you can rotate and, and do something else. But so many organizations, um, uh, you know, maybe it's part of maintaining the silos uh, that some people feel tied to, but it is really, really hard for a lot of organizations, honestly, to put the customer first. There is a lot of internal interest um, that unfortunately blocks that. When you're working against a, here's all the stuff we want, whether it's a product manager, or what a customer might want. Yeah. You know, but if you pose the question to them, if I could get you 20% of that in four weeks yes. and then give you the rest over time, as opposed to waiting six months to get it off, yes. would that be, would you be okay with that? <laughs> Nine times out of 10, they're going to say, hell yes, act, exactly. absolutely. That's a and great might idea. How could you do that? Right. They're happy. So <laughs> that's that change of frame of reference and how thinking about it differently. Very much. Fair. I think we're ready to move on to our next topic. All right. We are watching Texture and Gang. We're going to take a break here. We'll be back with the future of e-commerce, but I won't be. I, I need to run out to a webinar. So I'm going to hand it over to very, very capable Mike Vizar. Double will and say, have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs> All right, folks, and we're back for our final segment, and we're talking about e-commerce and the impact AI will have. Um, there's an article up on techstrong.ai about this. We invite you to check that out. But I'm going to go to Lisa first in this because I have to say, all these e-commerce sites I see out there, they all seem to be the same. They're kind of boring, and I can't help but feel that we're in some sort of rut here. So can AI do something for us here, and what might it be? Lisa, start with you. Definitely. It's, I don't feel that we're in a rut. Um, I feel that the pandemic was this, I always call it, call it a catalyst. Ellen was talking about DNA in the last segment. And I'm like, did he know I studied molecular biology and chemistry? So the <laughs> catalyst didn't. comes, yeah, it comes right into mind. I think what we, what we saw during the pandemic was this catalyst to really turbocharge this um, online uh, e-commerce experience. And while um, things came back to normal, the appetite that customers had for this experience being really customized, really personal, real-time relevant is only going up. So what organizations need to do if you're feeling, or if their customers are feeling, hey, we're in a rut, these sites are all the same, they need to really work on differentiation. Uh, the article mentioned a couple of great examples of retailers who were doing just that. And I have to say, I completely agree with the Sephora reference. I'm a Sephora fan. I got a whole bunch of it on here today, but they have a great experience where they're really facilitating the omni-channel experience. And that's what organizations have to do to differentiate. I want to be able to engage with a brand and Jenny, I can help feel this, whether I'm in the store, on the app, at home, and I want the experience to follow me where I go channel by channel so that ultimately I'm getting not just the products and services that I want, but I'm getting these recommendations because they've leveraged Gen AI to do customer segmentation analysis. They've leveraged it to do sentiment analysis, return prediction. So they understand much more about how the individual is interacting with them to deliver a much more fine-tuned and differentiated experience. And I think that's the opportunity that organizations have. Ali, what's your sense of what's going on here? Because I know you've worked on a lot of marketing stuff over the years, but um, what's your assessment in the state of e-commerce? Well, I think Lisa's take on whether we're in a rut or not is when I would, you know, I'd follow her on that. Um, I think that the the potential for this is maybe bigger than in almost any other industry because generative AI in particular 
it's kind of like a, I don't know, a communications amplifier if used right. And if used right is obviously a really important part of that phrase. Communications amplifier, uh, meaning uh, very much what Lisa was talking about, about an ability to provide more customized experiences. Um, because generative AI is not just using the one model that's trained on the internet and just regurgitating the same stuff. There's all ways that you tune and use rag and so forth to, to add a lot of context. And when you're adding co uh, contextual information about the, the session and the, uh, the, the shopper or customer and all that other sort of stuff, now you're really getting to this point where a person can interact in a very focused way and get that boutique feel from e-commerce. We are not anywhere near there yet, but it's clear um, what kind of uh, uh, potential generator AI would have. To I, I Listen, on the last segment, we, we talked about, don't, don't forget the whole point here is that there are customers and users for these automated systems. Um, that's the end goal, not to just throw them a whole lot of stuff um, at great pace and at great speed. So if we take the same principle here, um, I could see in two, three years really rewarding and satisfying shopping experiences that are also rewarding and satisfying marketing experiences for the retailers themselves to, to help speed up commerce and make it more productive and make it more useful for everybody. If that's happening now, um, it's only happening in bits, but it's definitely the potential. And we will hit some bumps along the way. I yeah, hope... Um both Guy and Lisa are suggesting that I might be suffering from attention deficit disorder here and that there are more <laughs> things going on than uh, possibly I'm appreciating. But um, <clears throat> one of the things I do see is, you know, there's all these bots on these systems and they're all kind of maybe first generation, but they're not very, um, shall we say, rewarding to engage with. So as we look at the future of AI, I mean, do you have an expectation or something you're kind of looking at these sites and the bar is going to get raised in your mind because if they don't have some sort of AI capability, you're going to be, well, this is, you know, somebody's site from, you know, last century. I think, I think that's accurate. And one example that immediately comes to mind is if you're on an, on a site and there is a box for you to get help or to chat with someone, the yeah. worst thing that I've experienced is for it to come up and say, we only stack this between these hours. And if you leave a message, someone will get back to you or, or, or contact us again within our business day. Well, you know what? My business day and their business day may not align. But if they have refined a really good chat bot that is staying up to date based on the types of questions that customers ask, it knows the inventory, it understands uh, shipping policies, return policies, all of that. Now I can get my answer. I, I'm a happy camper and I am moving on. And maybe, you know, I am an outlier. I don't care if it's a real person or not. I just want to get my task accomplished. And extrapolating that a little into the real world, I was on a road trip a few weeks ago and I was so hungry, and the only place I saw to stop was a Bojangles. Well, let me tell you. I pull up, and a voice asks me about my order, and I realize, oh, this is not a human. It's the AI. But let me tell you, the order was so fast, it was so accurate, made me think, maybe I should go to Bojangles again. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not that much of a fan. But it was just so seamless and professional, right? So I think a lot of it is going to be, what is my experience with this? Do I still feel that I'm valued? Do I still feel that I've gotten the right focus? Bingo. And am I getting what I need out of the interaction? If they can hit that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a gold mine. Tell you, yes. All right, we'll follow that through for a minute. Um, are we getting to the point where soon um, we may prefer the engagement with the digital human 
versus the normal humans that we might have encountered in the e-commerce support services because um, that AI agent will be more precise. I mean, is that kind of where the next thing is going to be? I mean, what is the going to be the role of digital humans in this whole e-commerce function? I don't know. Mitch, you want to jump in here for a sec? I think there are times when we change modalities and you know, we go from in-person shopping in a store to a digital store. Well, having a digital representation of a store hasn't really panned out as a great interface, great experience for customers because it's not doesn't have the same fidelity. Um, but there are other ways to do it. I, I think the rut, I'm going to take the rut position, Mike. I'll back you up. I'll, I'll give you some support, buddy. Um, the rut we're in is we're, we're tired of being inundated by ads. We're tired of being getting emails and we're tired of going on a website and we don't click on banners or we don't whatever, all that stuff on the side. You know what? I don't really care about all that stuff. I'm here to get what I'm looking for. What I think is smart, and it goes to the, the customer experience, just, you know, the pandemic was the catalyst to accelerate a lot of things. But to our earlier point, it could have accelerated in a really bad way or it could accelerate it in a really good way. And part of the focus needed to be and still needs to be on digital experiences, digital customer experiences, not the customer's digital, but the experience is. So what I mean by that, a good example of this, by the way, I don't need a 53rd bot. I already got so many dang AI bots. I mean, every application has one. I can't figure out how, what the difference and how to use each one because they all operate a little differently. So we got we got to fix the bot problem, Gen AI bot problem. But the other is, you know, let people consume information in the way they like to consume it. One of the ways I, I've really grown to like it is I don't like ads thrown into Facebook or my Instagram feed, but I love articles about ten, top 10 travel tips for the holidays coming up. Then and read an article of someone who's curated content to say, here's a great thing for packing your bags and, and packing your clothes in your bags. There's another thing for protecting your, your uh, RFID protection of your, your, um, your visa card or whatever it might be. Those I like to look at because it's like, that's a topic I'm interested in. Someone's curated now where AI I think, I think can come into this and we're, we're clearly not here yet is with a context graph, AI can map you to that information and curate it for you rather than a human always having to curate it. So for example, if, you know, I'm, I've been on Amazon and I bought rain gear for motorcycles in June, suddenly out of nowhere, I'm buying motorcycle gear. Probably means Mitch likes motorcycle gear. He might be interested. Matter of fact, based on what he's buying, he's buying touring kind of gear. So he probably has a larger motorcycle or some way he's, he's riding a bike now. Um, we noticed that he moved from Seattle to uh, Denver. So maybe he needs some cold weather gear. It's coming up on August and September. Okay. Well, based on what he's bought before, this might be of interest. You know, it, it's it's more than just what I bought before. It's the context of maybe where I live or the time of the year or what yeah. I've been reading about. You don't want to get into the creepy factor, right? You yeah, know, that's, I, uh, I was. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a balance. Yeah. You and maybe, up. well, I know. You just moved to Denver. What? Well, you notice that. <laughs> see, there's a level think, of trust with that. So yeah. if you build trust in that experience, okay, I'm, I'm willing to, to let you know, uh, be comfortable that you know that I moved to Denver. If all of a sudden I'm throwing stuff up of, here's now Denver restaurants, it's like, okay, this is not helpful. I didn't ask for Denver restaurants and I just moved here. And why is this thing given? That, that's what I mean is throwing stuff at us. But knowing why, because it's interacted with me and it's helped me in other ways, I'm going to help you in a similar way now here. It's got to build I trust. Yeah. I'm completely with yes. you, Mitch. But it's funny that you uh, that you said you're going to take the side, that you take the rut side, and your and your finishing is like optimistic. Here's how it could work. And in in your discussion of it, I think you pushed me onto Team Rut. But I think <laughs> I'm on Team Rut. You know, uh, uh, going forward. I think that, that what happens here is um, a lot of very interesting activity that's not necessarily productive, but you know, then we hit the rut. We're going to hit the rut in six months, nine months, whenever it is, because these uh, AI services injected into the shopping experience are going to start to to annoy people because we all have to learn by doing, including the people developing these things. It's going to annoy. It's going to concern. It's going to get headlines. That'll that's the rut that's coming. So I don't know if we're in a rut right now, but 
I have a I different see. vision of this e-commerce thing, and I think it's going to play out. I don't want to use your bot. I don't care what bot you put on your website. I'm going to use my bot. The bot that I'm going to have is my personal bot that I'm just going to go say, hey, I need a pair of jeans. Go find them and tell me where they are and have them delivered tomorrow and charge the card. And that is the end of my e-commerce shopping experience in my mind because, uh, and maybe it's just, maybe I'm a guy, and but there's a lot of folks who are like me. It's like, I go to the mall, I'm going there to get jeans, pull up car, walk to where the jeans are, pick up the jeans, go to the cashier, leave. So there are folks who want to have that whole shopping experience and it's a recreational activity, but I'm just saying that the current website experience isn't compelling enough for me to give up my personal bot to go hang out on your website. So and why do you want that personal bot? It Because it understands you, you trust it. You yeah. know, it's not going to take advantage of you. Um, a little, little different in your case, because if I remember, you only shop on Yankees ticket sites and <laughs> Yankees merch. So you're a little bit of a narrower use case, edge case, I guess we should say, but teasing you a bit. But that, that, that idea, you know, as one potential future, having that personal thing is because that personal is because you've got, you want to say relationship with it, but you've got trust in it. You understand it. It's learned enough about what you want to be effective at helping you as opposed to the 53rd bot that's annoying on this site too. Mm. And so yeah. I hope and mentioned nailed it with the trust piece and the value piece from a customer's perspective that those have to be there 100% yeah. for it to be successful and to evolve. Right. So now and you're, you're saying I've got a digital twin AI agent who understands my, my values, who knows I've already purchased a pair of swim fins. So don't show me 50 more <laughs> pairs of swim fins in hopes that I'm going to purchase more because I'm not. Um, let me tell you, whoever, whoever gives me that little perfected AI bot, uh, AI agent digital twin that can sift through all of the things, um, that that's beautiful because friends ask me sometimes to go and hunt things down for them because sifting through all the information but also if you think um my mind is going back to cosmetics there's uh the environmental working group right they rate cosmetics beauty products all of these things instead of having to go to their site which would be a bad thing for them i will admit but just saying instead of needing to go to their site now my little AI agent can say, oh, you're looking for mascara, but you want it to be highly rated on the environmental working group. You have all these other factors. Found it, bought it. It'll be at your house in two days. Bravo, bravo. Here's where my little dream falls apart in my mind. Um, so I'm going to have a bot that I'm going to optimize to find whatever it is I'm looking for at the lowest price I can get. The other people are going to have bots that are designed to sell this thing at the highest margin that they can get. And our two bots are going to meet somewhere in the ethernet and battle it out for control of this thing and then ground each other to a halt because they're both optimized for the exact opposite thing. And what, what are they going to do then? Send me an email saying, can you sort this out? It's when you send your bot to fight training camp so it can hey. be a little more effective at fighting the other bot. I feel like it's, it's like the uh, it's like the trading floor, right? Fight it's like the, like on Nasdaq, right? Selling and buying. Good it, point. It's it it would become something similar. We need Bot Fight Club. That's why we need. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like that. I'd watch that show. I'd go to a website to watch that. <laughs> we have robot versions of that. Well, if it's you? happening in the Ethernet or Internet or Ether or wherever it's happening. Uh, We'll need a visualization tool in order to see the blood and gore. There you go. Uh, all right. Lisa, last word on this. Are we are we daydreaming here or do you think this is how this might all play out? I think that I don't think there's daydreaming going on. There's a lot of different perspectives here on on this particular um, episode. I look at it through a, uh, an optimistic lens. Uh, I wouldn't say rose colored glasses, but I think I, I really liked what I talked about the omni channel customer experience and how we have this expectation as consumers that it's going to be that in a non creepy way to Mitch's point. Um, but it need we need to what companies need to do to differentiate themselves as I talked about earlier is they need to earn the trust that Mitch was talking about. 
to Hope's point, there has to be value in it for the the consumer. There has to be value in it for the business. They have to be able to demonstrate ROI and value. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I really do. I think, but I think we're at in early innings. I think we're at the, the kind of the tip of the iceberg. All right, folks. Well, I'm not going to get a hat, but I would like to see maybe let's make shopping fun again. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> I want to thank all our guests for sharing their knowledge and their insights. I want to thank you all for spending time with us and watching the show as always. And we have a great lineup of content coming up behind this. And of course, you can find this content on techstrong.tv, the website. We invite you to go check that out. Until then, we'll see you next time.